Designers and technicians are the army of backstage personnel responsible for the overall appearance, orchestration, and management of the theatrical experience. Scenery, lighting, costume, makeup, etc. Designers tend to work as a design team in close collaboration. The goal of all design is to coordinate with the core concept of the play. The first great phase of scenic design began in the Renaissance when theaters moved indoors for the first time. Painted canvases and temporary wooden structures could be used without fear of the colors running or the wood rotting or collapsing due to inclement weather. The Teatro Olimpico, pictured here, is the world's oldest surviving indoor theater. It's in Vincenze, Italy. It is one of three surviving Renaissance theaters in the world, and it was built between 1580 and 1585. The trompe l'oeil on stage scenery, designed by Vincenzo Scamuzzi to give the appearance of long streets receding to a distant horizon, was installed in 1585 for the very first performance held in this theater. It is the oldest surviving stage set still in existence. The scenery consists of seven hallways decorated to create the illusion of looking down the streets of a city from classical antiquity. A set of seven extraordinarily realistic trompe l'oeil false perspectives provides the illusion of long street views, but actually the set recedes only a few meters. The way in which the seats in all the parts of the theater were provided with at least one perspective view can be seen by observing the theater floor plan here and following the sight lines of the audience members in different parts of the theater. Gaslight, and then later, the electric bulb, allowed designers to create realistic illusion and extravagant visual spectacle. The lights pictured here were used in 1585 in the Teatro Olimpico. The proscenium format, which was developed primarily to show off elegant scenery, dominated theater architecture for 200 years, and it is still the most widely used theater format. Theater architecture. Staging formats can be described in four principal ways. The proscenium and thrust are the two principal types of modern theater building, and they account for more than 95% of the professional theaters in Europe and America today. Virtually all Broadway theaters are proscenium theaters. The proscenium arch creates the picture frame, framing the action taking taking place on the stage. Often an apron is added in front of the arch for additional playing space, When you uncover the apron, it houses the orchestra pit. The thrust stage places much of the action in the midst of the audience. There is audience seated on three sides, thus making it a more actor-centered format. A third theatrical configuration is the arena theater, or theater in the round. And finally, the fourth staging alternative is a black box theater, which is simply a bare room fitted with overhead lighting that can be configured in any number of ways. Proscenium theaters make use of either a wing and drop set or a box set. In a wing and drop set of realistic scenic design, the drops are painted in realistic perspective and flown in and out to give a lifelike illusion of location. A box set is a three-dimensional construction of interconnected, hard-covered flats built to represent a real location, very often a room in a house. Modern scenery is generally either realistic or metaphoric, or a combination of the two. Realistic scenery, as depicted here, attempts to depict specific time and place in the real world. Metaphoric 
favors visual images that seek to evoke the production's intended theme, mood, or socio-political implications. Metaphoric scenery tends to remind us that we are in a theater. It generally intends to draw us into the play's larger issues. Metaphoric scenery tends to be more conceptual than literal, more theatrical than photographical. Metaphoric settings can, of course, establish locales, but they are even more effective in establishing moods and styles. Since the 1980s, aided by computer-controlled lighting instruments and scenic elements, the movement toward a more conceptual, abstract scenery has inspired metaphoric scenery. Scenic materials, platforms, flats, and draperies are the traditional building blocks of fixed-stage scenery. Platforms, elevated acting spaces, any size, any shape. Flats, sturdy wooden frames covered in muslin or plywood and painted to indicate vertical walls, ceilings, any flat surface. Flats define our space. They can have windows, doors, archways. They can be freestanding, or they can be flown in or rolled on tracks. Drapery. We have the blacks, which are the wings, the main curtain, which is called the grand drape, drops, scrims, cycloramas, or as we call them, sykes. A scrim is a loosely woven gauzy fabric that looks opaque or solid when it's lit from the front and transparent when lit from behind. It's used to make things seem to instantly appear or disappear. The cyclorama, or psyche, is a hanging fabric that is stretched taut between upper and lower pipes, and it's often curved to surround the stage. It can be lit with strong colors for skyscapes or abstract backgrounds. Set pieces can be movable or fixed. A tree, a rock, a wagon. Stage machinery, turntables, elevators, hoists, rolling carts, and wagons. And props and furniture, props being anything actually handled by the actor. A cigarette, a wine glass, a telephone. Set pieces, stage machinery, props, and furniture complete the scenic designer's responsibilities. The scenic designer must be part architect, part engineer, part accountant, and part interpretive genius. He will begin with a sketch, then move on to storyboards or, for a box set, perhaps a scale model, and then he will give his final scenic design. Let's move on to lighting design. While lighting has always been a major theatrical consideration, in fact, the most basic of considerations for without light, nothing can be seen. But the actual vocation of lighting designer is relatively new, arriving in the 1940s and 50s. Visibility and focus are the primary considerations of lighting design. Visibility ensures that the audience sees what it is meant to see. Focus ensures that it sees this without distraction. Lighting directs the audience's attention. Verisimilitude, or lifelikeness, and atmosphere are the common goals of the lighting designer. Realistic lighting can be created to appear as if emanating from familiar or natural sources like the sun, a lamp, or it could be moonlight, fire, street lamps, creating lifelike light. Atmospheric lighting evokes a mood. Sharp, bold lighting designs can create more theatrical effects. Also, they may use chaser lights or spotlights. 
colored floodlights, gobo filters that break light beams into fragments or patterns to look like leaves of a tree or dappled light. The lighting designer is required to make two major preparations for the play. The first is a lighting plot. This is a plan that shows the placement of each lighting instrument, and it acts as a blueprint for hanging and focusing the lights. Once the lights are hung, patched, and focused, gelled in the appropriate colors, the designer begins working on setting the intensity of each light for each cue. Which brings us to his second preparation, a cue sheet. A list of numbered cues or occasions when the light changes in intensity or in color or moves. This cue sheet is directly tied to the script of the play. The costume designer. The costume designer creates the clothing for the play. Modern costume design may be said to serve four separate functions. One, to convey theatricality, a bit of theater magic. It must look real and yet look theatrical enough for the audience to say, okay, I'm in a theater now. Two, define place, historically, socially, culturally. Three, express individuality of character, the character's profession, age, wealth, class, self-image. And four, the costume must be wearable, movable, breathable for the actor. Generally, a separate costume sketch is made for each character. A costume designer selects and oversees the acquiring or building of all the costume elements. Sometimes costumes are assembled from actors' wardrobes, from thrift shops, rented from costume houses, or Sometimes a show is built from scratch. Regardless of how the costumes are made, through design and sewing or through selection from the local thrift stores, good costume design creates a sense of character, period, and style. In most cases, makeup and hairstyle design fall to the costume designer, But because the actor usually applies the makeup, the costume designer, the director, and the actor often collaborate on the precise makeup details. Illustrative makeup is the way the actor changes his or her appearance to become the character. Makeup can be used to suggest psychological traits of a character by shading or overemphasizing certain aspects of the face or features. Sound design. The development of audio recording and playback technology in the 70s and 80s led to the emergence of a designated sound designer in theaters around the world. Augmented sound, or in other words, microphones, are routinely used in theatrical performances today. And the use of recorded offstage sounds, such as foghorns, clock chimes, birds, thunder, traffic, help bring the play to life. There is also a new job in theater called projection design. It is the newest design area. The projection designer creates visual images that are projected electronically onto the stage, very often onto the psych. Digital imaging, video recording, computer designed animation, LEDs have all made the projection designer a new member of the design team. Special effects like fire, explosion, smoke, wind, rain, fog, blood. They, these elements complete the technical elements of theatrical design. Effects designers are not part of every production, but they have become more commonplace as spectacle has become a major part of Broadway musicals in particular. There is a veritable army of people backstage that are also part of the theatrical company. There's a production stage manager 
who coordinates the scheduling, staffing, and budgeting of the entire production, coordinating the director's work with that of the actors, technicians, and designers. During actual performances, the production stage manager will run the show, calling all the cues. He or she is assisted by an assistant stage manager or a number of assistant stage managers, depending on the size of the show. These assistants set props, prompt actors, give visual goes during the run. They are the eyes and the ears of the production stage manager. Then we have the technical director who is in charge of building and operating the scenery and all the stage machinery and special effects during performance. And he, in turn, looks over at the technical crews who run the scene changes, the prop placement, special effects. They are all trained by the technical director and they work under the production stage manager during a run. This also includes spotlight operators, light and soundboard operators. Then there are the wig masters, the makeup artists, and the dressers who help the actors backstage and in the dressing rooms if necessary. You might think the majority of these people do this work as a hobby. You would be wrong. There is a union called IATSE, the International Alliance of Theatrical Stage Employees. It is a labor union that represents technicians, artisans, and craftspersons in the entertainment industry including live theater, motion pictures, and television production crews, and trade shows. It has over 100,000 members, and they are among the highest compensated union members in North America. The pay varies according to the duties a theater technician performs, as these can cover many jobs from hanging lights to building scenery to sewing costumes or applying actors' makeup. But wages begin at $18 to $20 an hour, and most stagehands make around $70,000 a year in New York City. Another union, Actors' Equity Association, is the union of the actors and the stage managers.